From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. And here we are again, another edition of Chicago Newsroom right here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis. Hi, thanks for joining us for yet another week. And um, this is going to be our special uh, pre-Oscar show. We're going to spend the entire half hour today uh, getting predictions for who's going to win the uh, You know what? No, actually, we have Karen Lewis here, so maybe we ought to talk to her about something a little more substantial. Hi. How are you? Karen Lewis is the president of the uh, Chicago Teachers Union, as you probably already know. As I often say, if you watch this show, you already know this stuff, right? She needs no introduction. Um, we have so little time and so much to talk about, so I'm not exactly sure where we should begin because there's so many different things. But let's start at the where the news begins, which is yesterday. <laughs> Uh, I was there, I saw a rather tumultuous meeting, and it kind of made me think of those meetings back in Joe Hannon's days when I was mm. an education reporter, or Angie Caruso sitting up there, and, and Jesse Jackson at the podium. It was like, whoa, we've all been here before. <laughs> Um, but it is different, actually. It is way different. I, I actually believe the stakes are much higher now than they were even 20 years ago. So the, the news, of course, is that the Chicago Public Schools Board uh, voted to close and reconstitute, I guess the proper term now is turn around a bunch of schools. And um, there was a pretty heavy civic involvement against those closings, which is something that I don't think might have been predicted a year ago. Um, enough so that there were hundreds of people there demanding that this not happen, and the board, just uh, after hearing hundreds and hundreds of hours of community um, meetings and, and, and testimony before the board, just said, thank you very much for everything you've said. Now we're going to vote unanimously to do what we said we we're going to do. And they did it. You, uh, immediately afterwards, said that you think maybe this is something that the courts need to take a look at. Well, I mean, it's very clear to us that um, this is a political issue. This is beyond now an educational piece. It's not education policy so much. It isn't. It isn't. And it hasn't been for a while. And um, w we've been looking at school closings and turnarounds for actually about 10 years. So, and, and, and in the last five of them, really kind of like digging deep, as they like to say, about their data. Mm -hmm. And and what we find is uh, when we look at Renaissance 2010, for example, which oh, Renaissance 2010. remember that yes, purported to be right. an education plan was really a real estate plan. <laughs> so so they started going into areas that are gentrifying and closing these schools because they're so bad. When people started complaining, then all of a sudden they'd put a school in another neighborhood on the list because oh it was maybe under enrolled or something. They'd have all these different sleight of hand tricks. And the key was to have some public comment and then smile and say, uh-huh, and then that was the end of it. So about three years ago, um, the organization that I belong to, the Caucus of Rank and File Educators, um, we were just in schools, not understanding what was happening. Some of us were not even affected by these school closings. But we just saw this pattern of destabilizing public education. And, and who was behind it? It's like the civic committee, the, you know, the usual movers and shakers behind the scenes. Um, and what we started doing is questioning this and saying, you know, let's take a look at this. And are you looking at other alternatives? So if we go back to 1996, Paul Vallis puts 109 schools on probation. Now we have 289 schools on probation. Out of... So say six, let's six, just say roughly 600. 600, right. But, but of course, that doesn't of include, yeah, for purposes of discussion, mm -hmm. but that doesn't include the charter schools. Mm -hmm. So let's say roughly a third of the schools in Chicago are on probation. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, answer, the question about that is why? Because when you put a school on probation, the district is now responsible for running that school. So they're responsible for hiring and evaluating the principals. They have a tendency to just move people around like chess pieces into those positions. So we see a lot of disruption in, in the continuity of leadership in a building. Um, they also control the purse strings. They control the curriculum, not just what you'll teach, but how you'll teach. They control these parts 
of what a school on probation looks like. But when you look at the Board of Ed, they come back and say, well, obviously you teachers and you staff people don't know what you're doing, so it's got to be you. We're going to turn this school around. We're going to give it to someone else. We've given it a, a little bit of time and yes. nothing has improved yes. and so now it's time for draconian measures. We have, right. to, we have to fire everybody. We right. have to essentially restart the school. Correct. Now this is where it gets kind of rough to be. I, I wouldn't want your job by the way <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't. But it, it gets rough because we all know that the Chicago Public Schools, as with all urban schools in America, they're in rough shape. There's the, the accomplishment, the, the achievement levels are not what we want. Uh, we as a, as, a, as a society are not happy with the performance of our schools. And we want change. And so we elect people who say they are going to bring about big change. And one of the things that that immediately comes up, and it's obviously happening more and more now, is the question of how do you deal with the entrenched interests in the schools? That you have, uh, you have principals, you have teachers, you have, you have a bureaucracy that essentially celebrates the status quo and, and is more concerned about wanting to keep things as they are than instituting change. I think this is a public perception. I, I know it's a public perception and I think it's absolutely furthest from the truth of what goes on even within districts and within, um, within, within classrooms. All right, so for example, every year or two, they come up with some new curricular change because this is gonna fix it. This is the magic mm -hmm. bullet. This is mm -hmm. the thing that's going to fix it. So here we go. We start a whole new program. Right. So we've had mastery learning. We've had uh, reading first. We've had physics first. We've had all these different things that, that come down from the district mm -hmm. and usually, quite frankly, is vendor driven. Mm -hmm. Okay. So teachers are constantly getting themselves more endorsements. We were told you have, if you're going to teach middle school, you have to have a middle school endorsement. You have to do this. So we keep going, okay, we'll do whatever you say because we care about our kids. We want to make sure whatever happens, happens and we want to do good stuff. But unfortunately, we're not having honest conversations about how you measure achievement, first mm -hmm. of all. Yeah, yeah. And we're also not having conversations about the reforms that really work. Mm -hmm. So what happened yesterday is not new. It is the status quo. Arnie Duncan did this. Paul Vallis did this before him. I mean, we've had new names. As you said, you use reconstitution. This has all been done and proven that it doesn't work. I, I talked to somebody who worked on uh, one of the uh, University of Chicago studies, which, which we need to talk about in itself, and, and he used the term initiative pileup. <laughs> that, uh, that, that if you work in a school for more than a few years, yes. uh, there are closets full of, mm -hmm. of curriculum materials mm -hmm. that have been bought for God knows how much money. Mm -hmm. That, you know, as you say, a vendor comes in and says, mm -hmm. this is the new thing, it's going to solve everything, you have to buy this. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, throw it in that room over there, we'll get mm -hmm. to it sooner or later. This is, this is, I guess, endemic with large organizations of all sorts, but the difference here is that what we're talking about is, is educating our kids, so it has a little bit more meaning than perhaps, you know, the, um, the plumbing department over at, over at water or something. There was a, um, there are also are lots of studies piling up, as, as yeah. we all know. But this one is one that I know you're familiar with. This is mm -hmm. Designs for Change. This was released a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. perhaps a little bit too late to actually uh, ignite discussion before the board meeting yesterday. Would not have made a difference at all. Don't think for a minute <laughs> that data means anything. Okay, all okay, right. I'm so just a naive talk show host. Yes, I don't all right. Know I'm just, I just right. want to make sure our listeners are clear. Walk mm -hmm. me through this. The, mm -hmm. I have this this particular chart because it's colorful and it mm -hmm. shows up on television. But I'll tell you what I think this means, and then you tell me what sure. what is true. You you take out of the whatever it is, 400, 500 elementary schools mm -hmm. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You take out of those all of the schools that. Again, we're going to be using some shorthand terms, but but are mostly poverty schools. Okay. The, the, the children at the schools are 90, 95 percent qualified by the government as living in poverty. Mm -hmm. They're probably highly segregated schools. They're most likely on the south or the west side. Mm -hmm. You take that universe of schools mm -hmm. and you look at them and then you and then you study their reading scores 
over mm -hmm. about five years. Mm -hmm. And you look at their, and you look at the percentage of their students who are performing above mm -hmm. the ISAT standard, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You find this light blue section here is Chicago Public Schools, I, I guess we would call them conventional neighborhood, neighborhood schools, schools, right? Mm -hmm. Just ordinary, your run of the mill schools. Mm -hmm. You find that there are this number, I don't know what it is, 20 or 30 of them, are actually mm -hmm. performing above the city-wide average, mm -hmm. which which I have to say, I'll admit it, I was really shocked You didn't even see. know it, did you? I had no right. idea. Because I had if no you idea. listen to the media, everybody's failing. This well, I mean, here, yeah. you know, the, now the, this is this is an outlier, but sure. the Sh Chopin School is 94% yes. is yes. above the city-wide average, and yes. this, is a, this is a school that's, you know, in the middle of the most challenging neighborhoods right. with the most challenging, but okay, but that's... So that's, you want to know what's going on there. Well, yeah, but 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 it's important to, to look further down. You get down here, this is the average line, okay. and then you keep going down and down and down and down, and you finally come to the first school. These white lines here mm -hmm. are schools that were turned around and turned over to AUSL, Correct. the uh, Academy of Urban School Leadership. Awesome. And yeah. this is this is the this is the controversial mm -hmm. flavor of the day because mm -hmm. these guys are now many of their top people are now running the board. They're actually board members who, who yeah, were the, brought in. Yes. So a lot of the contracts are going to AUSL. These turnarounds that voted yesterday are going to AUSL. Mm -hmm. So Designs for Change took a look to see where the AUSL schools stack up. Now this, you know, these are statistics and mm -hmm. statistics can be maneuvered. But when you look at over the two pages, you see that the, the white bars here, the AUSL schools are kind of clustered toward the bottom of this universe of schools. Mm -hmm. So after four or five years of these kinds of turnarounds, it's probably safe to say they're not, per they're not doing particularly better than the schools that they replaced. At least that would be a safe thing to say, would it not? It would absolutely be that, and it's something that we have tried to speak to constantly but so not so, the, so the the question that I'm left with as somebody who had never seen this laid out this way before mm -hmm. is what do these principles and these teachers in these schools have to teach us because there there's right. something really kind of extraordinary going on in these schools now granted this school might not be the kind of school that Mm -hmm. your, your average middle class person would say, I want to send my kid there because it's a great achieving school. But mm -hmm. given the situation that it's in, mm -hmm. it's achieving brilliantly compared mm -hmm. to what it might be. Right, so you want to know yeah. why does school, and I actually know people that work at Chopin, so it's pretty easy to talk about Chopin and other schools. What you see in schools that are in high poverty and challenged areas that work are a variety of things. But the most important thing is a trust amongst the administration and the staff. And when I say staff, I don't mean just teachers because people like to focus in on teachers, but we're also talking paraprofessionals, the lunchroom ladies, the janitors, the engineers, everybody that makes a school community work have a certain amount of trust for one another. So, so it's that's just a place that works. It's a place that works because people feel safe to even do innovative, interesting, creative things because that's what improves education, is not necessarily um, uh, a script, mm -hmm. but let's figure out how we do this. They also tend to be a little smaller in terms mm -hmm. of their, so they have a little more flexibility in how they work with one another. You have a high degree of collaboration amongst the staff. So not just between the trust between the administration and the, the staff itself, but also within the staff, you have good trust and you have people who are willing to say, you know what, I tried this, it didn't work, can you help me, can you give me some ideas about it? Those are honest conversations that if you admit weakness now, there's somebody here ready to get rid of you because you know we have this whole need to call for teachers' heads because obviously it's our fault that children aren't succeeding. So. They also have adequate resources. They have strong local school council, parental support, community support. That's what you see that makes schools, and, you've, and they have not just safety in terms of physical safety, but that emotional safety, where children can sort of relax and breathe and allow some of those problems that exist on the outside to kind of stay there. So, 
All right, this is a softball question. I'm sorry, I apologize. But what is the what is the purpose then of bringing in these kind of quasi business uh, not for profits like AUSL to to just dramatically turn a school around? Wh why? What is the thinking about that? Well, I'm asking the wrong person. No, but, but if you look at, a, at at an organization like AUSL that started out as a training organization, let's let's try to train people to work in urban schools. We obviously have some issues here that we don't have other places. But then that morphed into this kind of, well, let's run some schools and let's see if this works. And as you know, when people become friends of people, that's who you recommend to do work for you, right? Um, I think, unfortunately, what has happened is that what we have seen in, in, in also schools, for example, is a real concentration on, let's bring these test scores up, let's bring these test scores up, because that's how we're judged. You also see in these schools a very high degree of turnover of not only faculty and staff, but you also see a turnover of children. So there's a move to get rid of the children that are a little hardest, uh, excuse me, a little harder to educate. Um, and those who don't. Even in, the, in, even oh, in yes, these schools. Absolutely. Because and I mean, then, we certainly and heard that said about oh, the charters and It and happens Noble here. Let me, let me tell you what I know about AUSL. There are a couple of things that are going on that I think are very interesting. One, um, at one school, when the schools around them close, also sends a delegation over to the schools that are about to close to find their highest test scores and to invite them to come to their school. So now if I get the higher test score kids coming in, that'll really help us, so that'll push us up some. I mean, these are the kinds of practices. Mm -hmm. AUSL principals telling people, um, you know what, make that kid's mom miserable so she will pull him out of the school. So there are ways. Uh, th that's, that's quite an accusation. That's a make. huge accusation, I mean, and I can back it up, and we can talk about that off camera, but I will tell you, here's the other piece that happens. You suspend school children. You have a zero tolerance of of which plays in the media of discipline. as these, these people are finally bringing right. some discipline into right. these crazy schools. Right. But what then happens is that once you get into these policies where you start suspending children, then you automatically also push out a lot of children who need different supports. I mean, the and there's issue no place is, for them to go. Exactly. So so the other schools that they're coming after now are like the remnants of, I look at the schools in Bronzeville where they've closed down all these schools in Bronzeville with their Mid-South plan for Rennie, Rennie Tenney. Um, and now you have schools that are not, that have been sabotaged. I mean, for me, Ken, that's the hardest part about this. The sabotage, the deliberate taking of resources away from neighborhood schools, shifting this and, and putting lots of money in the AUSL schools, and you see the results. Well, I, I, that's something that also needs to be pointed out, is that, that when a school is, when this actual legal definition is applied and the school becomes a turnaround school, mm -hmm. all of a sudden a lot of money goes in. There's like hundreds of dollars per student being given to it, millions of dollars, uh, maybe in seven million mm -hmm. in capital to each school. Mm -hmm. And of course you would say, and others might too, well, why don't you just put seven million bucks into this school <laughs> and see what it can do. But you know what, we, we, we're not going to resolve this and we are, we're already 20 minutes into this discussion. Here's what I want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. let's, get, let's get big picture on, on you for a minute. Um, there is a, a growing perception fueled by the politics of our nation and, and some of the particularly Republican leaders like Scott Walker and others that teachers are a major contributor, if not the major contributor, to the reason that our schools are lousy. That, that um, they're greedy, they, they get paid too much, they have too much time off, they don't work very hard, and then the schools don't work very well, and then they run to people like you, the unions, and the unions just r go out on the street and fight for them, and, and mediocre teachers are, are allowed to stay on. I don't even want to ask you about that because I, I already know that, <laughs> that you think that's crazy, right? But here's what I do want to ask you. We had Mr. Brizard on the show the other day, also a very personable and likable guy, and I, and I told him 
I won't repeat the whole thing, but but said, you know, basically this this is not something that I consider to be new. I was in the Chicago Public Schools as a student 50 years yeah. ago, and the schools that I attended were pretty crummy. They weren't very good. I didn't get that great an education. I don't I don't look back on those as great years. I had some spectacular teachers, teachers who who literally changed my outlook on life, and I'll remember them for the rest of my life. I also had teachers who were just phoning it in and they were worthless. And then, of course, the bell curve, there are all these other kind of, you know, okay kind of people. As the, as the person who represents teachers in Chicago, how do you respond to the public perception that every school, every principal knows this, every school has teachers that are just yeah, they're just burned out. They're beyond their time or they're just not very good. And we need to we need to move them out so that our most precious resource children can be served better by newer, better people. What do you do about that? All right, well, first of all, what I want to do is is quote from um, one of our attorneys who is a labor lawyer and has worked with labor unions for years. And when he came to work for the Chicago Teachers Union, he said, you know, I thought it was kind of hard to get rid of a tenured teacher because this is what you hear all the time. He says, it's pretty easy and they do it pretty fast around here. Now this is what my attorney says. The reality of that conversation is that that teachers do in Chicago have a 90 day um, time period to remediate. The rest of the state it's 180. So last year they changed the law so that the rest of the state is 90 like Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's number one. First of all, before we start labeling people and pointing fingers at people, one of the things I think is extraordinarily important is for us to talk about how do we remediate people first. But we are in a mentality now where everybody watches Donald Trump say you're fired. Exactly. And everybody yeah, wants yeah, to yeah, do that yeah. to everybody. Right, right. right? So and I don't. Is, I, I, I'm no. watching TV. I don't. I don't care right. about your remediating teachers. Right. That exactly. teacher's bad. I want that teacher gone. Out now, right now, right, right now. Yesterday. Well, and and part of the problem is what you said earlier. We have initiative overload. We have all these different things coming the pike. We have a variety of teachers who do need help, but once they get the appropriate help and remediation, they'll be fine. And if they're not, then they need to be observed and evaluated appropriately. The issue is that we have had a very broken evaluation system. Principals whose responsibility is to do this work have been asked to do a million other things. I mean, there are all of these things. There's no one answer to this, Ken. So the fact is everybody hits a wall at about 20 years. Everybody hits a wall where you, you reflect and you try to figure out, is this where I should be? Should mm -hmm. I be doing this? Mm -hmm. Because this job, quite frankly, gets harder and harder and more difficult every year. No doubt about that. But also think about what it means to have this conversation going on around us constantly, demoralizing us, tell us we're failing, when we're also seeing the sabotage of our system and of our children. Mm -hmm and being blamed for it. And again, what other profession do people go in their own pockets and buy stuff for? I mean, just, do you buy your own pens that you get here? I mean, even I do, but TV, that's but even <laughs> but at that's Can TV, TV, they give you pens. I know you did not bring this in from Staples, so. Actually, I did, but that's uh, beside the that's point. Right. No, no. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's a, you know, it's a complicated question, Ken. It is and extremely I am not, complicated. I am not gonna sit here and say, that there are people in our profession that are not appropriate for it. I'm not going to say that. Mm -hmm. But there, as there are in every single profession. Right, right. So the key, it's just is, that we, 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 the key is, for some reason or other, we have absolutely all the accountability now and none of the resources to make those things happen appropriately. You gave, you guys did this the yes. other day, yes. and, and we just, we literally have blown through so much time, we don't even have time to talk about the fact that mm -hmm. you guys came out with your own plan mm -hmm. for what you think ought to be done with the mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. And of course, the press on it was, oh, it's going to cost $700 million mm -hmm. and there's no money for this. So it was just kind of, that was as far as it got. Right. But there, of That's course, what they say. there is right. money. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter, a matter of how you, how you allocate that money, mm -hmm. which brings us to the fact that that you guys are, I presume, now actually in negotiation yes. with, with the, the CPS, right? So mm -hmm. there are negotiations going mm -hmm. on right now. Obviously, um, 
I could ask you how they're going, <laughs> and I don't think I'd get an answer because you, I would tell you, 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 can't, you can't talk about we it. We right? have conversations. We are in negotiations, and they are as negotiations mm -hmm. are. So tell me a little bit of something about just the mechanics. I, I'm not interested in the, mm -hmm. well, I'm interested in the issues, but mm -hmm. I know we can't talk about the issues. How does this work? Do your guys and their guys just like go out for coffee, go no, to a restaurant no, no, and sit no, and talk? No, 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 these no, no, they're very formal. We, we sit have, across we a sit table? across a table. Where? Your um, place or theirs? We alternate. Oh, okay. Uh, we All alternate. Right. Um, what we've also done that is a little different is that we have a 35-member bargaining team that comes with us. It's not just the you officers. Do? Yes, we because people that are working in the schools need to be able to talk to the people sitting across from us oh. who, by the way, don't really know necessarily what's going on in the schools. Yeah, yeah. So that when they read our proposals, our proposals were also generated by our rank and file. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't just sit in a room and say, okay, let's do this, let's do this, let's do that. Mm -hmm. we, ha we went through a process of vetting our proposals through committees. The committees reported to our House of Delegates. Mm -hmm. And then this larger bargaining team, which represents every single functional group that we have within our Wow. within our union is also part of this process. Now we don't meet all the time with the very large one, but we, as much as possible. And do they have a big contingent too? <coughs> no, no, they, <coughs> they have the, the, their um, smaller group, but they also will bring in people that are specific to certain mm -hmm. items that we want to so talk about. So there's there's no part of this that's informal. It's not, the, you don't just sort of like hang out in a cloak no. room and just no. kind of no, grab I mean, each other's elbows and no, stuff. No, but Nothing we do. Like we talk to each other all the time because there are other things that come up that we need mm -hmm. to deal with. How so often do you talk to J.C. Brazar? You know, we text more than we talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, our lives are pretty filled, busy. filled yeah. and busy. Um, we have a regularly scheduled breakfast that meets once that we are. And I mean, I bring stuff to him. He brings stuff to me. Oh, we so have you actually have FaceTime yes. the two of you together? Yes. I know that yeah. surprises everybody. Well, I, no, I, actually, it doesn't surprise me because, uh, as I said, I, I think y you both are people of that nature. I just mm -hmm. can't imagine you guys not wanting to sort of reach out to each other. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of the way you both are. But I, I'm, j I, I'm just fascinated by the mechanics of how something mm -hmm. like this happens. I mean, to bring these two giant organizations together and try to come up with something. So. Um, the Tribune says they have leaked documents and that uh, they have some numbers and all that. Do you want to characterize whether you agree with anything that was in the Tribune? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take that as a uh, we're in negotiation and I can't speak to that. <laughs> That's perfectly okay. Karen Lewis, we are out of time and I, I really enjoyed having you here and I uh, obviously will have the, the discussion carrying on because we got a lot more to talk about. Have okay. me back. Okay, great. We will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Karen Lewis is the president of the Chicago Teachers Union and, um, you know, it's going on. We'll, we'll be covering it for a long time, I'm sure. You've been watching Chicago News. I just had another question, but we don't have time to ask it. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's the community service of Can TV right here. You can see us and you can find all the other programs that are on Can TV at uh, Can TV dot at cantv.org. You can also backslash to Chicago Newsroom and check out our archive here. And you can do that on iTunes and you can download the podcast. Oh, it's tiresome. So many ways to watch our show. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week with another edition of Chicago Newsroom right here on CAN TV.